see your faces, and you're like, what's wrong with you, Mike? There's nothing wrong with me. But the reason I love this type of stories that I'm attracted to these is because there's always redemption about to happen. There's always victory about to happen. There is somebody about to go from the valley to the mountaintop. And this is your story. This is my story. This is God's story. It's the story God tells. You know, the garden was beautiful. You know, the Eden was created. There was no sin. And then, lo and behold, humans were born and created, and sin came along with that. But the story didn't end there. There is a story of redemption. Jesus coming back and saying, wait a second. God didn't lose this battle. That was just the beginning. So what is your favorite story? I love this. What I'd like for us to do in the next few minutes I have here is to look at the story of Moses. Okay, it's the story of Moses. We know this story very, very well. And, and if you look at Moses' lifestyle, if you look at his story, what we see is a man who was powerful, a man who did so much for God, a man who spoke to God face to face. But we rarely see ourselves in Moses' story. We don't see ourselves as powerful as he was. And what I would like to do today is to really help you and I see our story through Moses' story. Because it's not only Moses' story, it is God's story, and it is your story as well. If you go through the, the life of Moses, there's many, many interesting stuff. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Moses, as you know, he spent part of his life with Pharaoh. He was being trained. You know, he was the Pharaoh elect, about to be, become Pharaoh someday. Life was good. We know that at the beginning, God's people went to Egypt because of the famine. And after being there for about 350 years, they were basically, they went from being God's people, they went from those who saved the world to being those who were neglected, those nobody cared about. And then Moses born, Moses was born, and Moses coming, his birth was actually a result of people praying to God, say, God, we can't take this anymore. We've been, we came here as victors. We came here and now we are victims. We can't take this anymore. So please answer our prayers. And Moses was born. What would I tell you? If I, how would you react to what I'm about to tell you? That... Some of your prayers may not be answered in your lifetime. Would you still pray? Would you still be like, okay, God, I, this, is, this is a need for my country. This is a need for my city. This is a need for my family. So I will pray even if you answer in the next generation. For so many years of prayers, Moses was born. How incredible is that? Are you going to remain faithful in your prayers? So a new king came, and you know, the Bible says that, you know, he did not know Joseph and all that he did for the country. Next slide, please. We'll find our first passage here. Exodus. If we can turn to Exodus, Exodus chapter 1. I'll be reading 6 to 10. 6 and all the way to 10. Exodus. Moses' life, a timeline. His life did not start out well. You know the story, but let's read it together. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. They died, they were no more. So a new came come and he said, let's do this. We must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave our country. God blessed the Israelites so much so that the Pharaoh and all Egypt became so fearful, so afraid that they said, you know what, let's treat them harshly. Okay, next slide, please. So what happens? Moses was told, uh, the, the midwives were told when the Israelites were about to have a baby, here's what you should do. If it's a boy, you kill it. 
if it's a boy, you throw the baby in the Nile. Let's get rid of the boys. Let's suck out their strength. Desperate times. I don't know if there are moms in this room here with boys, or even forget about boys, children. And hearing the edict that the king, Pharaoh, just laid out. If a baby is born, just, just kill it. How would you feel? Especially if you have a relationship with God. God, where are you? But this was always happening. You know, in 19, uh, late in the 60s and in the 70s, China, the population was growing so much that they couldn't contain. They said, this is not sustainable, so here's what we're going to do. The one-child policy. I mean, today, we, when you think about it, that's mind-boggling. But they wanted to take action. They wanted to find a way to be in control, to sustain. That's what the Israelites were doing. Even worse, let's just, not just one child policy, let's kill the child. Exodus 2.16. When you have a Hebrew woman in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. I can't imagine that. I can't. But the story of Moses is a story of redemption. It's a story that is so powerful, so moving, that if we can all see ourselves as redeemed by Jesus, we will be energized. We will go from feeling like victims to victors. Exodus chapter 2. So here's what's happening. Now Moses is, and all the Israelites, their prayers were about to be answered. If we can go to the next slide, please, so we can read this together. Exodus chapter 2. And we read that, it says, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Right there. Could you imagine nine months of delivery, nine months of you know, pregnancy, not knowing if you're going to have a boy or a girl? Can you imagine the agony? The frustration. Okay, God, give me a girl. God, give me a girl. I don't want a boy. This is not 2018 where you can just find out, okay, what am I having? You know, what am I having? So I can get ready. I can, you know, set up the room and all of that. This was nine months of agony. And lo and behold, but when she could, it's a boy. So when she saw that, he was a fine child. He said, sorry. She hid him for three months. Three months. You know, some people have babies. You get pregnant and they try to hide it, right? And, you know, I don't know. I know there was a time, a friend that I know, she was going for an interview and she was pregnant. And, you know, because for some people that could be a yes or no, right? And you don't know, just put it on jackets and you don't know, just, you don't know, go in and present it and have an interview, but, you know, just trying to not uh, reveal what's happening. You cannot do that with kids. <laughs> you know, they scream. Especially all the boys. And you know what the, the tension and the pressure on Pharaoh was, let's find out, let's investigate. Okay, you had a baby. Is that a boy or girl? Three months, Moses was hidden. But you know, they realized that we couldn't have a three. But when she could hit him no longer, she got a Paris basket for him and coated it with tar. And she placed the child in the, in the Nile among the reefs. And basically said, God, this is what I have. And I'm throwing my son into the Nile infested, the crocodile infested Nile. Can you imagine? Can you relate? Next slide, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown, is that what I have? Next slide. There you go. All right. So, Slavery years, baby Moses is born, and he makes his way from the Nile to the palace. From the Nile, from the crocodiles, hanging out with the crocodiles, to Pharaoh's palace. Can you see redemption here? But what happened? Listen to this. So they left the baby there, and guess what happened? One day, after Moses had grown, I'm missing a slide. And I wanted to share that story with you because it's so powerful. Yes, Exodus 2, 4 to 10. It is so powerful. 
when you think you are down and out, that is when God comes in. That is when God comes in to lift you up. When you are down and out, that's when God comes in to lift you up. Here's what I mean. So Moses, by the banks of the river, one ten, well, Moses' water, a sister, waiting to see what God would do. The baby was crying. Pharaoh's daughter was going for a bath, a bath, with maids. Scripture says the baby was crying. I think sometimes when we are in pain, we just want to cover up. It's okay to cry. It's okay to say, I'm afraid. Because when you are down and out, that's when God comes in to raise you up. Let's read this. So his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him if he was going to be eaten by the crocodiles. Can you even imagine that? I would have just thrown the towel. God is over. I got to go. I can't see this. I can't experience this. I can't watch my brother, my little brother, about to be eaten by crocodiles. This is too much. And God, where are you? And God, some guy called Joseph who came here and you raised him to second to Pharaoh. Where is that story? And maybe today that's where you're at this morning. God, I don't see you in my life. God, I read all these things in the scriptures, and it's all great. I look at my neighbor, my friend, people I've been coming to church with, and they're successful. Life is good. You know, they get promotion every six months, and I get demoted every two months. God, what are you doing in my life? But what do we see here? God comes in when you are down and out to lift you up because he sees your future. He sees your future. Verse 5. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, uh, and her attendants were walking along the riverbanks, having a good time, right? They, they don't worry about life. She saw the basket. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to go get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. That was God's favor right there. That was God's favor right there. Do you see God's favor in your life, even in the midst of your pain and misery? This is the one of the Hebrew babies. Next slide. No, I think you're taking me back. I'll tell you the story. You know, so, so the, the princess said, okay, you know what, let's take the baby. Let's take the baby to the palace. But here's where it gets powerful. Moses' sister shows up. Hey, hey, do you need help? I can help you. I can find one of the, the Hebrew women to take care of the baby for you. Great, great idea. You go do that, and by the way, tell the person I'll pay them. I will pay them to take care of the baby. Do you see God in your life? Do you see God working powerfully in your life? Even and especially when you are down. So the princess said, what a great idea. Do you know there are things God is doing in your life as I'm talking to you right now that you have no idea that is happening? But you don't see it. You don't see it, and you get down, and you get discouraged, but your story is a story of redemption. Your story is a story that is just being written. You may have been on a particular chapter for too long, but it doesn't mean the book ends right there. Moses' mom didn't believe that putting his son in the river was the end of Moses. The Bible says he saw the child. Some translation said... He was no ordinary child. He was no ordinary child. He says, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I love my son and I'm going to hold on and I would do anything for my son. And so, I want you to stay by the Nile and see what will happen. So Moses gets free education. Free education, I'll show you a little bit later on. Free education in the best university ever. Free scholarship to MIT, 
right? I don't know if it's the University of Ottawa or Carlton, and you know, it's always this contention happening here. But the best university, back in the days, it was actually the best country in the world. Where are you at? Where are you at? Exodus 2, 11 to 15. So now Moses is all grown up. He loves the palace, but he knows who he is. He knows where he comes from. He knows that his redemption was not enough, that there was a whole country, a whole nation waiting to be saved. And some of us, including myself, we have received God's grace and we've kept it to ourselves. We come to church, we go to midweek, we read our Bible, and, but that's it. You have, you have been redeemed, you have received salvation, but you cannot, I cannot keep it to myself. we got to know who we are and where we came from, what God has done in our lives. And how all we have to do is turn around to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends in school, and reach out to them. Moses knew who he was. He knew his identity. His identity was he was Hebrew, who by God's grace is alive. So he says here, you know, so he goes on one day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people, his own people, were and watched them in their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing to the right and to the left, and seeing no one there, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two brothers, two Hebrews, fighting. He asked one in the wrong. See, right there. He, he, right there, you could see Moses was all about delivering people. He made an assessment the first day, the, the day before, of course, killing somebody is always wrong. But even here, he said he knew who was wrong. There were certain things about who he was that God was just shaping. God was just forming. And in the, in the end, it will come to fruition to do great things for God. Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Next slide, please. Why are you doing that? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you going to kill me too? And then right away, Moses knew what had happened. That not only... You know how sometimes we hide certain things in our lives? That we look at left and right and there is nobody there, but if there are people are around us at church or at work or at home, we're so righteous and life is good, a smile is wild. But no, God sees it all. God sees it all. And if God sees it, you know, sin is obvious. Other people see it too, right? And so that's what's happening here. When Pharaoh, verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled and went to live in Midian. Uh, Midian. Next slide, please. You know, the palace years, it was Moses' plan. You know, I'm here. You know, this, I think this is what God wants for me. I love this. And I'm going to save my people. But then he went from the palace years, where he was for 40 years, to the desert years. Another 40 years. And then from there, this is what I call the destiny years. Because of what God has done, because of the pain that he has gone through and the things God has taught him in the desert years, God was preparing him for the destiny years. That's God's faithfulness in your life. God's faithfulness in my life. The question is, how do you tell your story? How do you tell your story? Would you, Moses could have said, hey, you know what? Life was really, really good. Life was good. You know, three months, you don't know if you were, uh, you know, taken from the Nile or not. All you knew was that, you know, hey, Pharaoh, I was one of the boys. And eventually I was going to assume this throne. That's what he knew. But later on, he realized, wait a second. Life is not always, you know, a walk in the park. He had to experience pain. But in those years, the beginning, we talked about redemption. God redeemed him. In the desert years, God was redirecting him. And in the destiny years, God taught him resilient, how to be resilient. 
God taught him resiliency because that's what he needed to lead the millions of people out of Egypt. But how did it all happen? Next slide, please. It's all in how you tell your story. Moses could have said, he could have said, I was abandoned at birth. Next one. I was raised by strangers. Next one. I was a criminal. I killed somebody. And I was a fugitive. I just had to run for my life. And then the next one. And God is absent. And God is absent. Either he's absent, he is late, but he doesn't show up. He could have said this. This could have been his story. And I know right now, you may be reading this, you may be hearing this. It may be hard for you to take it in. But it all begins in here. What goes through our mind? The story that we tell ourselves. And if you press the next one, it's a downhill. It's a downhill slide. There is nothing good happening. There is nothing good happening. You may be saying to you, my life is wasted. My life has ended. Nobody cares about me. God has abandoned me. You know, and, and it's all my fault. It's all my fault. Some of us, we actually take it to the next level. It's my parents' fault. It's my church's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's just every single thing about you is negative, negative, negative. This is what Moses could have done. But guess what? In the process... God was doing something amazing. God was doing something powerful. You know, Hollywood tells us that our lives should be always be, you know, nice and clean and beautiful with a lot of money. That's not reality. That's not what we read. We read the scriptures and we see lives like we see scriptures like this. We see stories, we see characters like this, and we form, we reframe the way we see our lives based on what is in the scriptures. Is God absent in your life? Is God absent? The radio is always on. The electricity is always on. But sometimes we don't tune in. And if you're not turning on the switch, if you're not tuning in, of course you will miss it. But even if God is missing in your life, even if God is missing in your life, can I, can I share something with you that I try to do? When I don't see God working in my life, I said to myself, whose faith can I borrow? Whose faith can I borrow? Who is closer to God that I can just tag along? I can say, hey, look, I'm not feeling great. Whose faith can you borrow? Peter did that beautifully in the scriptures. You know, Peter was sitting in the boat with the 12, and everybody's having a good time, and then there was this ghost walking by and say, no, it's not a ghost, it's Jesus. Jesus, is that you? Yeah, you're walking on water? That's awesome. Jesus, okay, um, hmm, it would be nice if I can walk on water. I think it would be great. But I don't have that faith. Hey, Jesus, tell me to come. Jesus, tell me to come. And Jesus said, well, come along. And then he went. And then he saw the wave. And, you know, then he went from Jesus' faith to his own faith. And you know, what, you know the rest of the story. But I love that story because it tells me that we can borrow God's faith, Jesus' faith. And Jesus, even in the agony, in the midst of the cross, he knew God was with him. So if there is nobody here in the world that you can borrow their faith, can you borrow Jesus' faith? Can you see God's presence in your life? Let's slide. A couple of questions for you to think about. How do you tell your story? How do you tell your story to yourself, right? To yourself and to others around you. How do you tell that story? Is it a story of rejection and abuse and defeat and abandoned and isolated and just dark and gloomy? And who will follow you? Who will want your life? Nobody. Who? Gosh, misery loves company. Bye. <laughs> I'm not going to be a part of it, right? How do you tell your story? Because guess what? You and I are always writing. We're writing our own story. We communicate verbally, non-verbal. We are telling our life stories. Next question. If you, sorry, if God were to tell your story, if God were to tell your story, 
would it match your would it match the story you're telling yourself if god says okay okay here, here's what we're going to do okay chris okay i got chris in the back okay chris i want you to write your story up to today take a piece of paper and write it out and then god says okay while you're doing that i am also writing your story and then in the end you and i will have lunch and and discuss and see you know i mean you know yourself right and i think i know you being god would it match your story would god be proud to show your story to people around you and would you be proud to show your story to the people around you or you'd be like no no no, no. let's 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 hide my story I, I hate my story how do you tell your story i'm going to skip the next slide the next slide is uh, exodus 3 this is where moses uh, was called uh, by god but I wanted to show you this, which is one of my favorite things in the scriptures. But God. The best phrase in all the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, is this. But God. But God. But God. It is powerful. Here's what I mean. Okay. Look at this. I was abandoned at birth, but God showed up. But God showed up. I was abandoned, but God showed up. I was raised by strangers, but guess what? God took me to the palace, gave me free education, the best school in the world, the best leadership, free leadership training. We pay money for leadership courses. I got one, but God used that to give me leadership training. Next slide. I was a criminal. But God taught me patience. I was a criminal, but God forgave me. I was a criminal, but God entrusted a whole nation to me. How awesome is that? Next one. I had to run for my life. But you know, those desert years, God was putting the finishing touches on me. God was refining me. God was preparing me. God was saying, you are not a failure. I am not done here. That, that was just the redemption process. Now I'm taking you to a new phase in your life that I'm going to redirect you. And after that, I'm, because of the redirection, you are going to learn to be resilient. Some of us, let's be honest, we are too soft. That includes me. Guilty. We care too much. Oh, you, I'm hurt by what you said. I'm hurt that you forgot this. I'm hurt you didn't do this. We're not resilient enough. Christian or not Christian, life is tough. And I think sometimes, yeah, we're redeemed, and so my life is supposed to be all, no, 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 no. Jesus. I mean, think about it. Are we really disciples of Jesus? Denying, carry that cross, and follow me. My friend Peter, whoa, 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 Jesus, that, that ain't happening. You're not going to Jerusalem. Get behind me, Satan. Because you do not have the things of God in mind, but of this world. Some of us, we got to get back to discipleship. And just, Jesus is Lord, and I follow. And if Jesus is Lord, and I follow him, then I got to be resilient. I got to hold on. And when I have nothing to hold on to, I got to hold on to his faith. I got to borrow his faith. Let's move on as we wrap up. You know, God is absent. God is absent. And you will see it and you will feel it. John the Baptist saw it and he felt it. He was in prison. And even when you're in prison and you may not have windows, send people to go see what's happening outside. John the Baptist, okay, uh, God, you sent me here. I'm not sure if this Jesus, you know, I came here as a message. Is this Jesus really the one? I don't know. I'm struggling. I don't know if I'll ever come out. But John the Baptist wanted to see what is out there so he can continue to hold on. God may be absent, but if the story you've been telling has been a nosedive, then in your story he will never show up. But if you can be honest and say, but God, but God, but God, you will realize that he will show up again. 
he will show up. He always shows. The issue is, am I going to stay when he comes? Am I going to stay when he comes? You know, I think sometimes the way we see ourselves, right? You know, we, you know how racial profiling and all this stuff? We profile each other. We profile ourselves. Knowing me, here's what's going to happen to me. Can you, can you relate to what I'm talking about? Knowing what has happened in the last hundred years of my life or whatever that number is, here's what's going to happen to me. I remember a time that I was driving around a little bit, you know, um, a little bit, I guess, suspicious. And, you know, I was just riding at an intersection and I had to find a way to, to I had to decide if I was going straight or I was making a left. And I just caught myself in the middle. I caught myself right in the middle. And just a split moment, a split, split moment, I saw a police officer right there on my right. And I panicked. Because I've been followed before, right? Been chased around and been doing whatever, right? But I wanted to confirm. And so I made a left, and right away I started panicking, thinking, I'm done. I'm going to get a ticket. So, you know, 10 feet from the stop sign, I would stop. <laughs> you know, every second I would look around, you know, just, am I okay? Am I just going to see this, right? The gentleman just followed me for about 10 stops. Then I made a right. I said, I'm going to lose him. This is a big lane, you know, three lanes. I got in. I made sure, usually I don't always do that, but I turned right, you know, the closest lane to the right, and then I changed lane, and he did the same thing. So I'm like, okay, it's done. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got to Black Creek and Lawrence. I was going to Ed Bahula's house, and then I saw that he made uh, a signal to go on my left to exit. I'm like, okay, thank you, God. Thinking was over. But he got to me, and all I saw is this. Obviously, I'm looking at him, right? And it's like, okay, window down. And he said, your license plate is late. It's expired for two days. <laughs> it was November 13th, my birthday, November 11th, and I hadn't renewed my sticker. And he said, it's late for two days. I'm like, thank you, officer, for the warning. From the beginning, I knew there was something going to happen. And I started panicking. And I probably made a lot more mistakes because in my story, one tiny little incident that happened 15, 16, 17 years ago, I carried that with me. And so I see an officer, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Versus, wait a second, if something happens, it happens. But I'm walking around so afraid and I'm wondering if you are doing the same. I'm wondering if you have seen, maybe you have uh, felt forgotten. Maybe you have felt that well, there's, I don't see God in my life. And that story that, was, that happened maybe 20 years ago has been the story that you are continuing to paint, continuing to tell. I want to encourage you this morning, one, to see yourself in Moses' story. God came to die for you and I. That's one. That is just the beginning. Our adoption into God's kingdom is just the beginning. Our baptisms can never, it should never be the highlight of our relationship with God. That is just the beginning. That is just the tip of the iceberg. There is more. There is more. There is more. We have been redeemed. And we got to be resilient. And we got to embrace the new direction that God is giving us. Thank you very much.